GPS is based on time. A satellite 12,000 miles up in space sends a signal to Earth. This is picked up by our GPS. The time it takes the signal to arrive tells us how far away the satellite is. With signals from three satellites and using a process called trilateration, our GPS can work out where it is. With the signal from a fourth satellite, we can get a three-dimensional position, latitude, longitude, and height. The more accurate the clock in our GPS receiver, the more accurate the position. General GPS accuracy is to within five meters. We can improve accuracy by augmenting the GPS position with information from another source. We can do this through differential GPS, that's DGPS, and Wide Area Augmentation System, WAS. Differential GPS is a ground-based augmentation system. Errors are worked out at a known location and transmitted to GPS receivers in the area. Accuracy improves to two meters. Wide Area Augmentation System is a satellite-based system. Designed originally for aircraft, the WAS satellite knows where it is and corrects the GPS satellite position within your GPS. New GPS sets are equipped with WAS and it improves the accuracy to two meters. There are other augmentation systems. We have real-time kinematic, which surveyors use, which is accurate to one centimeter. Then we have continuously operating systems networks and satellite laser ranging with accuracy to one millimeter that allow geologists to measure tectonic plate movement. There are three GPS systems currently in operation. First, we have the American Navstar system with 24 or more satellites and at least four in view at any one time. Then, we have GLONASS, the Russian system, that's improved greatly in recent years, and BNS, the Chinese system. It's operational in China and the Asia-Pacific region and will be fully global during 2020. Europe have been trying to get their own satellite navigation system, Galileo, off the ground since 2005 and it keeps being delayed. Currently, it's scheduled to be fully operational in 2025. We will see. All our Western GPS sets are chipped to receive Navstar, and new sets are being chipped to receive both Navstar and GLONASS, the advantage of this being greater reliability. GPS gives you position on the Earth's surface and height above sea level, speed over ground, course over ground, bearing and distance to a waypoint, time to the waypoint, cross-track error, and estimated time of arrival. It's highly accurate, as we've seen, but the signal from the satellite is susceptible to ionospheric interference, delays to the signal as it passes through the Earth's atmosphere, and delays where the signal bounces off buildings on its way to us. You need a good separation of satellites. We're aiming to get a horizontal dilution of precision, or DOP as it's often shortened to, of one or under. That way we're getting the most accurate position, at 5, we're a little less accurate. Anything over 20 is not great. Keep the aerial on board as low as possible. Most people have them on the push pit. Of course, people can spoof and jam the signal. The USA had been building in an offset as a result of various Middle Eastern wars right up and until May 2000 when Bill Clinton switched it off. But of course, we all knew exactly where we were because of differential GPS, so they weren't fooling anyone, which of course is why they switched it off. A word about GPS. Some phones and tablets do have true GPS received from the satellites. Others do not get true GPS. Their position is ascertained by triangulation from three mobile phone masts. This means that clearly they can only operate within mobile phone range and so around 8 to 12 miles offshore, but no further. Once you lose phone service, you lose your position. Now GPS on the chart. The Earth is not perfectly round, and so making flat charts requires a number of fudges, which are called ellipsoids. The net result is that different people develop different datums for their charts, and there are many datums. I think my early GPS had something like 200 datums, and you have to make sure that the GPS is reading the same datum as your paper chart if you're going to plot the position from the GPS onto the chart. 
Fortunately, all charts are now being upgraded to read one datum, World Geodetic System 1984. So as long as your GPS is reading WGS84 and the datum on your chart is WGS84, all is well. As a matter of interest, the umbrella term for navigating with GPS is now called Global Navigation Satellite System. So we are studying GNSS. And the advantages of GPS are pretty obvious. It's very accurate and reliable and quite brilliant to have your position to within two meters, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. But you do need to be careful about inputting data and making errors with this. Nowadays, we're placing waypoints onto the chart plotter with the cursor or by touching a screen rather than having to input a lat and long by pressing the buttons, which invites human error. And of course, people can believe blindly in their GPS. Worse, they can spend their time looking fixedly at the screen and not taking time to look out of the window at the road signs of the sea around them. Just in case anything might go wrong, we always run a paper plot alongside the GPS. If you plot a waypoint on your chart plotter, the GPS will take you directly to it, even if that's over land. He's not that bothered, so always check that the route you've plotted is safe. Never place a waypoint on a charted mark. The accuracy of GPS these days means that you will probably hit it. Understand what your chart plotter is telling you. Some will take you directly to the waypoint without allowing for the tide. Here, the red line is the route we wanted to take from our start point to the waypoint. The yellow line is our heading. The blue line is the course we need to steer at the moment to make the waypoint. And the grey dotted line is our course over ground thus far. So as you make your way to the waypoint, you have to keep altering course because the cross tide is pushing you off course until finally you're facing directly into the tide. Some chart plotters will give you a proper course to steer. Here the bearing is 77 degrees and we have to sail at an angle of 81 degrees, a course to steer, to travel directly down the 77 degrees bearing line and check whether your chart plotter is giving you bearings in degrees true or magnetic. If it's degrees true, this allows you to plot the chart plotter bearings directly onto a paper chart. If it's degrees magnetic, this will allow you to use your hand bearing compass in conjunction with the chart plotter. If it's set to degrees magnetic, what magnetic variation is it set to? It's an advantage to have the magnetic variation set automatically. That way the chart plotter should give the correct magnetic variation wherever you are, but you must check it's correct. Now, the charts in your chart plotter, these are called electronic navigational charts, ENCs. And we can have these either as vector charts where the data that made up the paper chart is taken and layered, or we can have raster charts which are a digital replica of the official paper chart and which are not layered. Vector charts allow us to zoom in and you can choose the level of information and detail you want and you drill down to get information on charted marks and the like. A word of warning, not all the information may be available when you're zoomed out and so to check that a route is safe you need to zoom in and have a good look at what's there. Here's a vector chart and we can see pier head starboard hand mark has a green teardrop which tells us that it has a light but it doesn't tell us what the light sequence is so to make sure we're looking at the correct boy at night we need to drill down and find the sequence. We press once on it and it asks us if we want information on pier head. Indeed we do. So we press again and it tells us again that it's pier head boy and gives us some depth information. And then we need to press again to find the light sequence. Quick flashing green. Excellent. Now we know. You cannot zoom in on a raster chart in the same way unless there's a larger scale chart underneath. Then it will bring this up. Remember, a large scale chart covers a small area and a small scale chart covers a large area. Of course, we don't need to zoom in on a raster chart to see the light sequence of pier head. It's written here. But if we zoom in on a raster chart, it will go out of focus unless there's a larger scale chart beneath, as is the case here. Some raster charts don't bring up the larger scale charts underneath the smaller scale charts, but offer you a list of charts from which you can select, like Meridian Chartware here. 
And here is the Imre raster chart offering. Here again, they have a large scale chart under the smaller scale chart. So now we can get the detail on Brixham Harbor. One chart plotter called TZ iBoat offers you both raster and vector charts. It also allows you to add the light sequences to the boys on the vector chart, which is the sort of facility that usually only the professionals have on their vector charts. And you can add information into your chart plotter to give you things like tides. Here, a tidal height. And here, a tidal stream. And here, in more detail. And you can have tidal heights and tidal streams presented at the same time. Or you can add overlays from outside sources, such as AIS and radar. We can overlay wind and pressure and rain and wave heights. We can even have a look at the seabed. Some plotters overlay information that tells us when to tack to make the windward mark, working off live updates for tide and wind. This is B&G's sail steer program. And we can color areas of the chart to alert us to shallow water, which gives a quick visual warning. Here we have no colored safety zone set. Here we've set a colored safety zone of 5 meters. And here we have a colored safety zone of 10 meters, all depths being chart datum. Apart from plotting a satellite-derived position onto a paper chart, we can also prepare a waypoint web. This is useful if we're going at some speed. We draw lines out at 10 degree intervals and then mark off distances of, say, one mile. Here we are entering Dartmouth, and we've set a waypoint just outside. We've drawn a web and taking the information from the plotter that says that the waypoint bears 340 degrees 2 miles, we can plot this straight onto our chart or we can set up a cross-track error ladder. Here we are, three miles away from our waypoint and 0.25 of a mile to the right of our desired line as taken from the chart plotter. And we can place that directly onto the cross-track error ladder on the chart. Now here's a useful app. Our plotter tells us we are moored, and indeed we are. And if we want to know how to get from our mooring in the Hamble River out to Southampton Water, we can use the dock to dock facility from Navionics. So we'll press on our start position at our berth. Oh, he doesn't like that. Something wrong there. Uh, anyway, let's just zoom out to uh, find a spot in Southampton water that we can press on. And out we come, out we come. Right, we'll press on a spot there. And there we go. Straight across the car park and down the high street. Because that's what GPS does. It's direct. And then he realizes, ah, we're going to need to go by river because we're a boat. That's smart. Um, Yes. Oh, he doesn't like that. We're boxed in. So he wants us to get out into clear water, into the river, before we can start to navigate his route. And of course, don't forget, we're going to check this route to make sure we're happy, that we read the road signs and it's safe. And he's taken us inside Campbell South Cardinal, but that's okay because there's water there, but straight out into the middle of Southampton water, into something big and dangerous. So we'll keep to the shallow water. But See what he's done, and it's very clever, but we must check the route is safe for us to navigate. When it comes to planning a route, you place your waypoints on the chart, select activate, and the chart plotter will take you from one to the other. It won't generally route you automatically. It will beep to let you know you're at or near your waypoint, and you have to hit OK for it to tell your autopilot to steer in the direction of the next waypoint. You see, you are the skipper. You are responsible. Here we are on a vector chart, and we're going to place a waypoint. There's one up there. We'll put another one down near Thorness Bay, um, another one just north of the North Cardinal, um, above Black Rock, and then one down the Needles, just for a bit of fun. And being a vector chart, you could zoom in and interrogate them. You can also move your waypoints around a bit. And then what we will do, we will just zoom out so we can have a good look for a second and then we will hit the start button and that would set us off on our route. We're obviously going at naught knots because we're not doing it, uh, but gives you all the detail that you would need. This program from PC Plotter has given us a proper course to steer. It's even told us the best time to depart to make best use of the tides. The difference between the smart devices and the standalone chart plotters is that standalone plotters have been designed for the marine environment and can get wet and they can get hot and still keep working. They can show you the seabed and have touch screens, give you a chart, a satellite view, a bird's eye view, overlay the radar. 
and modern standalone units could be linked to Wi-Fi so they could be updated automatically and can offer you all the facilities of a smart device. The smart device, which has not been designed for the environment, I know some tablets are waterproof, needs to be treated carefully. This is what my iPad gives me when he gets hot, so he stays under a tea towel on passage to keep him out of the sun and away from the odd dollop that can make its way on board. And do make sure that everyone knows their way round the chart plotter screens. It's no good if the helm is having a challenging time and needs someone to give him some information from the chart plotter down below and they don't know how to do it. Worse still if the screen has become locked. Touch screens on standalone units can be locked to prevent rain tapping on the screen and interfering with them. Make sure everyone knows how to unlock a touch screen. Finally, you may wonder why you have to press OK every time you turn on the chart plotter. Here, Imre are even telling me that their app is not for navigation. Hey, what do you think I bought it for? Well, this is because, in part, the GPS signal is easy to hack or to alter, but it's also because they don't want you to believe in the GPS to such a degree that you ignore the road signs, the buoys, the lights, the depth, the weather. A GPS chart plotter is an aid to navigation, just one of a number of aids to navigation, and what you can see with your own eyes is probably the best aid to navigation you've got. So match up what the chart plotter is telling you with what you can see. And that's GPS.